Gases are one phase of matter where the atoms are not condensed. So what that means is that we have, if we have a container that is containing a gas, it will all be spread out throughout the gas or throughout the container. This is different from a liquid or a solid. If we have a liquid, then you know it sits in the container. If we have a solid, it sits in the container. And they both take up whatever the shape is. Well, the liquid takes up the shape of the container, and the solid usually has a fixed shape. And the gas is different than both of these. It takes up the uh, shape of the container, but it can also take up any shape or size of a container. So our modern understanding of gases looks at individual gas particles and what they're doing. But when scientists first started studying gas behavior, they didn't, you know, they hadn't really figured out what the atomic nature of matter was like. And so instead of trying to figure out what individual gas particles were doing, I don't know if you, you know, if that would have even made any sense to them, they just studied systems of particles. So they would take a whole gas sample and then they would look at how it behaved. And in good scientific nature, they would limit the number of variables that um, they were trying to pay attention to. And so they would keep some of the gas uh, or some of the properties uh, fixed for the extent of that experiment. And so uh, throughout this set of experiments, we have four gas laws that explore different relationships in the physical properties of the gases. So the properties that they studied were the pressure, which we talked about a little bit in the previous video, the volume, so how big the container is and how much space is being taken up, the temperature, which most people can measure, and then the amount of the gas. And we are going to use moles for uh, the amount. That was not a concept that they under, that, you know, that they had either, but they just looked at amount. We're going to talk about it in terms of moles, and we're going to use the lowercase n to um, symbolize the moles here. So the other things that you need to know is that when we are doing relationships in um, between different gas properties, we want to only study uh, the relationship between two variables at a time, and we're going to keep the other ones constant. So the first gas law that we're going to talk about is first only in chronology. It's called Boyle's Law, and it's named for Robert Boyle, who was studying gas properties in uh, the 1600s. And he looked at the relationship between pressure and volume. So in his experiments, he kept the temperature and the amount of gas constant. So he probably had some kind of a fixed uh, container that he could control and allow the pressure to change and the volume to change, but no gas would leak in or out. And he must have had some kind of way to control the temperature as well. So what he found was that as he, he uh, changed the pressure, so if he increased the pressure, then the volume would decrease. And so what this means is that the pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. So we write that as a mathematical expression as P and then this little funky symbol here um, that looks a little bit like an A or maybe a fish. And this is the proportionality symbol. So this means is proportional to. And what it means for something to be proportional, it means that P is equal to 1 over V times a constant. And I'm just going to use the constant A as a placeholder here. So another way of looking at that is to say 
that if you take pressure and you multiply it by the volume, then that will be a constant number. So whatever pressure you have and you multiply it times its volume, that's one number. So that means that if you have one pressure with its volume that goes along with it, that is equal to the constant. And now if you change the pressure and then you allow the volume to change, these will also still be equal to that same proportionality constant. That's what this relationship means. And so one of the things that we often see with Boyle's Law is we rewrite this and we say that if we change the pressure, the volume will change by this relationship here. So this is what is considered Boyle's Law. And another way of looking at this would be to graph the relationship between pressure and volume. And if you um, know what y equals 1 over x looks like, it is an inverse proportional. Let me draw a nicer one. It is an inverse function. That's about the best I can do, I guess. So as we are going to higher pressure over here, you can see that these points on the line would represent pressure volume points. So the pressure here, that would be P sub A, and it would correlate with this volume V sub A. So now if I decrease the pressure over here to some new P sub B, then that decrease in pressure would allow the volume to expand. So these pressure volume changes would follow this inverse line and we can do easy calculations here using Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law is looking at the pressure volume relationship but um, about a century later we had Jacques Charles who also was studying gases, and he looked at the temperature and volume. And he held the pressure and the amount constant. So we have a general sense that if we're looking at a gas sample, that things usually, let's think for a second about the relationship between the size of something, that's the volume, and the temperature. So if I have something that is like this, and here is its initial temperature and volume, and now if I increase the temperature, what do you think is going to happen here? Most people, I think, think about uh, things expanding when they increase in the temperature. And that is, in fact, what happens with gases. If we increase the temperature, we also increase the volume. So this we can, re uh, we can write as a relationship saying that volume is proportional to temperature. That's the same symbol we just had over here. We're talking about proportionality here. So the reason why we say proportional to is that we say that this um, volume and temperature are not equal to each other. They're equal to each other only if you have an additional constant that is um, multiplied by uh, one or the other of these. And I'm going to use a different constant because the number is different between the two proportionality constants in here. So we can do a similar kind of relationship for a initial and a final kind of system the way that we write for Boyle's Law. Notice that if we write V is equal to T times B, then this gives us that V1 over T1 is equal to B, which means that V2 over B T2 would also be equal to the same constant if this volume and temperature, these are different relationships. So we can see that depending on how we want to plot these. 
if we write the volume on the y-axis now and the temperature on the x-axis, then we can see that this is a linear relationship. We don't really know, you know, what the slope is like on this kind of a relationship, but we can go ahead and plot it. And you could write this just as easily with the volume and the temperature reversed. It would still be a linear relationship between the two. It might just have, well, we just have a different slope. Okay, so if we write these together then, we can say V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And this is called Charles Law. And of course, most people don't use the French pronunciation. They just would say Charles's Law, but it's Charles. All right, so these are our first two gas laws out of four. And so let's go ahead and take a break here from um, introducing new material and look at a couple of practice problems where we can use Boyle's Law and Charles Law. Charles Law. So we might have some problems that sound like this. A sample of gas has an initial volume, I'm going to say V sub I, is equal to 2.61 liters. And an initial pressure of 3.14 bar. If the gas expanded to 5.69 liters while holding temperature and moles constant, this is sort of understood, what is the new pressure? All right, so this problem involves volumes and pressures. So this tells us that we need Boyle's Law. So we're going to refresh on which that one is. P1V1 is equal to P2V2. So P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. Just like when we did dilutions calculations and we had kind of a similar looking equation, obviously this is a totally different one, but the important thing isn't which one, you know, whether you put the initials over here and the finals over here. The important one is just to make sure that you group things together. So this volume goes with this pressure. And then this volume goes with this other pressure. So just make sure that you keep your numbers together. So we would have 2.67 liters multiplied by 3.14 bar is equal to 5.69 liters multiplied by some pressure. And the pressure it, over here on the right hand side is the one that we want to solve for. So we can do that by dividing out the 5.69 liters on both sides. So these mathematically should be really pretty simple. So when we cancel this out and we do this math, you should get that our pressure is equal to 1.44 bar for the final answer. So let's take a second and look at those numbers and see what should have happened. So let's review. We had a volume and we had a pressure. Then we increased the volume. So we gave the gas more space to be in. And if we give the gas more space, then we expect that the pressure should decrease because these two properties are inversely proportional. So let's check. Did they? Yes. The pressure went from 3.14 bar down to 1.44 bar. So we did see the decrease in the pressure that we were expecting. Okay, let's try another practice problem. Let's consider that we might have a sample of gas has volume equals to 4.27 liters 
at 298 Kelvin. Oh, and don't forget, just a little side note here, Kelvin is a temperature unit and it is converted from Celsius degrees by adding 273.15. So if you have 25 degrees Celsius and you add 273.15, then you get 298 Kelvin keeping addition rule significant digits appropriate. No decimal places will be kept. So 298 Kelvin is the same as 25 degrees C. Okay, so let's get back to that problem here. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Now we're gonna heat the sample to 348 Kelvin. And our question is, what is the new volume? This time, let's actually make our prediction before we do the calculation. So let's think about what's going on here. We have our sample of gas, 4.27 liters at 298 Kelvin. And now we're going to increase the temperature. So what do we expect the volume to do if we increase the temperature? We're gonna expect our new volume to be bigger, right? than 4.27 liters. Because when we heat things, we do expect the volume to increase. So let's see what happens. Let's actually do that calculation. So our relationship from Charles' law is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So let's see. Let's find how our numbers group. This volume goes with this temperature. And this temperature goes with our unknown volume. So we have 4.27 liters over 298 Kelvin is equal to our unknown volume over 348 Kelvin. So we can rewrite this. We can move this over to the other side and then just solve for V2. So that would be 4.27 liters times 348 Kelvin divided by 298 Kelvin. And this should get us to 4.99 liters. So this did increase in volume a little bit. Now, notice right here that all of my temperatures in this problem were in Kelvin. So let's think about whether or not we could have our temperatures be in Celsius or in Fahrenheit degrees. So, you know, would this work if I did my calculations in either of those two? So if you've ever done proofs in mathematics, um, what you need in order to prove that something doesn't work is just one example when it doesn't work. So let's think about an example where temperature is equal to zero degrees Celsius. What would happen to my mathematical expression here if one of my temperatures was zero degrees Celsius? Do you remember what happens if you have a number over zero? This goes to infinity, right? And that's not actually going to work for us. So because temperature or because our Celsius degrees and our Fahrenheit degrees, these both can equal zero at regular you know, temperatures where we do stuff. 
So they don't actually work. So we can't use either degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit in gas law problems. All of our temperatures must be in Kelvin. Okay, so in the interests of not making videos be super long, I'm going to go ahead and break up our, our four gas laws here, and then I'll put together another video with the other two gas laws.